Up next, uh, Mark Schulze, VP of Clover, if he's actually in the room. Hello. Yes. Oh, he is there. Okay, great. Uh, and Mark's been around tech for quite a long time. Uh, biz dev hacks that no one tells you, tricks and tips for closing deals and making it rain. Let's hear from Mark Schulze, baby. Thank you. And, uh, I can't believe there's actually a, a biz dev talk here. I'm kind of excited. It's not, not something typical for Silicon Valley. Uh, in fact, I think even myself, uh, I spent my first 12 or 14 years in product marketing and product development for companies like AOL and Tuit. Uh, eventually ended up running product and engineering for Match.com. And I went into biz dev by necessity about six and a half years ago. But if you had told me at the beginning of my career I'd be up here giving a talk about biz dev, I probably would have said, oh, you know, kill me now. That just sounds... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, when, when I was by necessity asked to uh, take that role at Quantcast, I, I joined the company right at the beginning, and, uh, and really with the premise, uh, the, the, two, the two main founders are friends of mine, and they said, well, what can you do? I, I, you can do anything, right? Why don't you do biz dev for now? And so I, I jumped in with two feet, and I think because I was a product guy, I took a little bit more of an analytical approach to it, really trying to understand what drives people, what drives deals, what drives companies to act, what drives people to act. And what I figured out was, I think we're born to do it, right? So <laughs> this is an ancient business meeting. Uh, what's the purpose? People have, been, people have always been meeting. They've always been collaborating. Uh, millions of years ago, there's a lot of evidence that people were wandering around in the savanna of Africa, and there were uh, major depopulation events, where entire tribes were decimated. Uh, people were dispersed. And the people who survived are the ones that encountered others out there, and the ones that were able to collaborate Okay, we'll figure out who should help them and who, can, who can't help them. Those are the ones that survive, right? So getting together, working together with other people is something natural to us. Now, of course, uh, things got more complicated over time as technology evolved. Uh, things got more complex. But is it really similar today? I'd argue that in many ways, a lot of the core tribal um, sort of vestiges that are bred into us uh, still remain. Little things, like what's up with this? Like why do we still shank hands? I mean, it spreads disease. Uh, what is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's important. It's important uh, because it, it, it's something that's developed you know, you know, over hundreds of thousands of years. It's something that really uh, connects people. And what I found that uh, in general in business is that when you're, when you're talking to someone, you're trying to cut a deal, it's almost as important who you are as a person, what you bring to them, People are always sizing you up trying to figure out if you're a friend or a foe. They want to know, is this person on my team? Do I want them on my team or on, the, on another team? Is this someone who can help me now, later in my career, in my current job? Can they get me a job later? Is this person smarter than me or dumber than me? I found that these factors, especially in a startup, are almost more important than anything else. Just, just as you hear about how VCs will uh, invest in teams because they believe in the teams, and the team is so important. The idea is a good thing as well, but the team is, the team is key. I think when you're a startup, when you were asking large organizations to put their name or their company's name or the company's resources on the line, the team is just as important. So you know, I would argue that companies are modern tribes. Uh, people size you up quickly. And what's really important is to try to figure out why you matter to them. What is it that you're bringing to the table? What are their needs that you're fulfilling? Uh, put your ego in a box. I've seen a lot of really terrible business development people in the Valley who the CEO gets on it because they want you to close a deal in the first quarter, and so they just hound you. Well, forget about that. It's about them. So, you know, how, how do you reach the right people? Uh, you know, I'm supposed to talk tactically this, so we'll get tactical here. Uh, don't rely on contacts or friends. Uh, I found that contacts and friends, people you've worked with in the past, they don't matter. You already don't matter to them. And the reason you don't matter to them, it's a little bit counterintuitive, I found that there's three types of people in the world. There's the people, your closest confidants, the people who do anything for you. If, uh, if Dave called up and said, just trust me, jump off this cliff, you'll be fine, he, I might do that for him, because I consider him someone who's fairly close to me. Uh, I think that in, the, in life, people only have enough that fit on one hand, right? Three to five people in the world that, that, that really matter. Everybody else, all your former colleagues, they're the worst people to go and cut a deal with. And I learned this the hard way. When I was at Quancast, I'd go in and talk to all these big publishers. So it was my responsibility uh, both to get publishers and advertisers on board, but also to get all the major publishers to take the Quancast pixel and to sign up for these different agreements. And I'd go to companies and I'd say, hey, it's great to see you. We catch up. 
they would be the right person to make a decision, and they wouldn't do it. And I couldn't figure out why. And I finally realized this goes back to the tribal thing. I'm already in their camp. They feel I'm in their back pocket. I'm a resource to them. They don't have to act because I'll always be there. Typically, the end of the conversation would be, oh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, tell us how it's going. Keep in touch, right? They don't need to execute on anything. I found that the people you don't know are actually easier targets in many cases. And the reason they're easier targets is because there's a binary decision when you approach someone for the first time. They have to decide, is this someone I want to be a friend or an enemy, a friend or a foe? It goes way back to that, those early instinctual cases. If you can show that you're smart, you bring an interesting product or feature, you might help them make money, it's at that point where they have to decide, OK, well, if I say no to this person, I'm going to do nothing, they're gone forever. Not like a friend. The friend's always there. They're gone forever. So what I found is that people you don't know are more willing to act because they want to form that initial bond, that initial relationship, and it's easier to get business done with people that you don't know well than with people you know. And for that reason, I think connections and address books are nearly worthless, it's, uh, especially with the advent of things like uh, LinkedIn. Uh, going to the top typically doesn't work either, I found, because uh, it's great. If it's a very small company, then the CEO uh, may actually, uh, you know, generally will make a lot of the decisions. But in a large company, even in that particular situation, the CEO needs to pull all those people on. So the CEO or the COO can say, let's execute on this, and something may not happen. It's much, much more effective if you can find someone lower in the organization, get them bought in, and then get them to carry you through the, out the organization. Because the, even the CEO, when they're making that decision, will feel more comfortable that it's properly vetted. Uh, another thing that I've found is that it's always more effective to find a product or a sales, uh, to go in through the product or the sales organization. Anytime, salespeople tend to be the most aggressive in most companies in bringing new, new culture, new ideas, new products. And the reason for that is because they're so tied, their compensation is so tightly tied to how much they sell. If you can do anything to help them sell better, they'll, they'll tear down walls to make it happen. Uh, don't go to functional units. Uh, there's a good example. I know someone who uh, was building a company and it was around analytics. And uh, he went straight into the analytical part of the organization and they're talking about this. It's one of the worst places to go. And the reason for that is because this particular company had signed a, a one-year contract and had already invested a half a million dollars a year earlier. And so for those, those leaders to go in, those analytical leaders to go into their boss and say, oh, we made a mistake. Yeah, we're going to use this one. It's only $20,000 versus a half a million. Then it's like, what, were you an idiot last year? No, well, it didn't exist. This is well, it doesn't work like that. So if you can go to sales, sales will make it happen. That's when it happened. They went to sales. They showed sales how this package would help them sell better. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter what the analytics team said anymore. Uh, product is secondary, so if you're, not, if you're not building something or selling something that will help uh, sales, if you're building something that will actually improve their customer experience, their customer resource management, whatever it may be, product is always an excellent second place to go. So I, about five years ago, I met uh, a salesperson from a completely different industry, and I think he gave me the most interesting advice I've ever received, and he said that you know, before you go approach a company, make sure you customize your approach. Really dig in and figure out what their problems are. And he simplified it in this way. He said, everyone has a personal problem, a professional problem, and a corporate problem, or a point of pain, if you will. The personal problem is something like, uh, I want to feel smart in front of my colleagues. I want to impress my boss. Uh, I want to do uh, really well so I get a promotion. Uh, I want to get that bonus so I look good in front of my spouse and they love me more. That's the personal problem. And you can usually dig in and get a sense of who somebody is and what drives them and find this out. The professional problem is people typically have a list of things they have to execute on so they can just do their job. So the first one, so it may be if you're sales, you have a sales quota. If you're a business development, you have to close so many deals in a quarter. If you're a product, you might have to ship so many products and, and, make, and make certain KPIs. And those are just the basic blocking and tackling that is in everybody's sort of job description. The corporate is, I just want good things for my company. I just want good things for my tribe. I just, overall, I just want to work at a place that's successful. If you come up with things that don't align with this, it won't work. So just to give you an example, I've worked with a lot of uh, uh, CEOs of small companies. And I remember I was working on one deal, and the company was moving kind of slowly. And the CEO said, well, just pay them $150,000. Just, just do it. And I'm like, ah, it doesn't feel right. And I didn't really know why at first. But I approached the company. I said, yeah, well, how about we just uh, kind of you know, make this easier? Let's pay you $150,000 for the development. Just make it happen. 
What I quickly realized is that just it's a non-starter. And the reason it's a non-starter is sort of, again, non-intuitive. It's a non-starter because it was a salesperson I was working with. He could take the 150, but it wouldn't meet his professional goals, so he can't count it against his quota. He won't get bonused on it, right? It's kind of nice for the company from a corporate perspective to get another $150,000, but even from the corporate perspective, it's, if it's not reoccurring income, it's just cash. You can't really, it doesn't, doesn't go against the, the bottom line. Um, and so that's a situation where an out-of-the-box sort of solution just was a non-starter, where ultimately it's figuring out what those individual problems are, solving those before you go in. And I found that if you can figure out what these three things are, these three points of pain and solve for them, you almost always win. Um, so get into that, how to, how, how to reach the right people. Uh, LinkedIn has been transformational, uh, but don't use LinkedIn the way, uh, I'm being very tactical here, don't use LinkedIn the way uh, they want you to use it. Uh, don't, don't ask people to introduce you to other people. Uh, that's burdensome, the, the introductions are slow, it generally doesn't always happen. Uh, I use the su subject line aggressively, people have very uh, low tolerance for, for email these days, and so I'll literally say things like, uh, you know, company, uh, just three keywords. Three keywords in the, in the subject line that attract enough attention to get things up, uh, get people to actually take a look and see what you read it. And, and pay for email. It's a remarkable, it's a remarkable product. Uh, it really works. Uh, sell you, again. Uh, when you're a small company, when I say sell you, I don't say necessarily sell you as a person. You do want to come off as a smart, intelligent person. But ultimately, this, this is sort of the, the sales page for my company, Clover. Uh, combination, it's a silly thing. If you don't do this, you should. I think most companies are doing it now. Faces and logos are really valuable. Because when you walk out of the room, again, as someone said earlier, people will only remember one or two things you present. And generally, it's probably something visual. So when they're discussing this later behind closed doors, they go, oh, it's those guys who worked at like eBay and Intuit, right? So suddenly, that's something that's memorable. And always, and always don't forget that there's great personal risk when you're working with a large company for the people who buy into you. So you know, make sure that you, you come up with something compelling. Uh, if you're a 500 startups company, don't be shy. Use that. If you're based in Mountain View and you're talking to someone in Kansas, they're going to be enthralled. They're going to be like, wow, Silicon Valley, that's so neat. So they're, they're going to want to connect. Right, they're, and, and they're going to be proud. Like I was talking to someone recently at a major hotel chain in the mobile group, and uh, I heard later that they were bragging that they were able to bring in these guys from Silicon Valley to show, you know, get them to these meetings in the office. And, and it wasn't even Silicon Valley, it was LA, but to them it was close enough. <laughs> Yeah, and then, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of the last uh, perspective, and change the dynamic. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, especially technical founders, uh, will sit in a meeting and they'll get frustrated and they'll say, okay, are you the right person to make this decision? Because they always tell you, figure out if this is the decision maker or not. Are you the right person to make the decision? Well, of course, everyone's always going to go, well, yes, of course I am. Of course I'm the decision maker. I'm empowered to make this decision. But the truth is nobody in a, in a corporation is ever fully empowered to make decisions. It's always a collaboration. And, and, and if you challenge people, they're going to try to take you up on that. But, but if you don't, if you turn the conversation around, you say, who else do you think might be interested in this? I'd love to educate them on it. I'd love to share more. Who else do you think would be interested in exploring this together? And that turns it around, because typically if you say, are you empowered to make this decision, the best outcome you can have is they'll send it down to someone who works for them, and you'll disappear down a black hole. If you say, who else might be interested, it switches the mind, and they start thinking up. So they go, oh, God, you know, I could take this to the EVP. I, I don't have a really good uh, uh, reason to talk to her or him. Uh, wow, I, I could actually really look good. You know, I saw him in the elevator the other day, and I had nothing to say. Now I have, now I have this opportunity to share this new cool technology. Someone from Fiverr and Starbucks, I hadn't heard of it, but it sounds great, you know, uh, Silicon Valley. And then you can actually help them sell. And one of the things I've many times have done is I've said, I tell you what, I'll give you my presentation. You repurpose it however you want, and I'll just, you just roll me out whenever you want. I'll just try to I'll just do whatever I can to make you look good. And that, that tends to work really well, and it builds excitement within organizations. So case studies. Uh, Winnie Disney. So legal is largely misunderstood. I shouldn't have said understood. Legal is largely misunderstood. So when I was at Quancast, one of the things we were trying to do is get uh, seven uh, major D D Disney corporate units to, to work with us. And I kept hearing back, oh, legal, it's illegal. It's illegal, it's legal roadblock. I'm like, all right, well, who are these legal people? And what's the issue? So I finally said, you know what? You know, sometimes in organizations, uh, if legal doesn't have the full perspective, they really appreciate hearing it. Uh, I'm going to be in Burbank. Do you mind if I just stop by with your legal guy and have coffee? They go, oh, sure. So I immediately bought a ticket to Burbank. <laughs> uh, flew, down to, flew down to Burbank and sat down with the guy. And 
ran through what we're doing. And I did not focus on a single legal issue. I focused on just the pure play pitch. What was so interesting in the vision of Quantcast. And at the end of the conversation, I said, so what do you think? Is this something that would be good for Disney from a strategic perspective? Lawyers always want to hear about the broader picture, and they never get to see it. So he was just so delighted that he was pulled in. He goes, yeah, I think this is a great thing. This is great for Disney. I go, oh, so sh should we execute it? The, you know, your, your counterpart's saying there's legal issues involved. He goes, oh, well, yeah, there's legal issues. And I said, oh, so what you're saying is this is a business decision, not a legal decision. You just have your, your concerns, and that's your job to share them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, a lot of people in these organizations don't understand that. Do you mind sending her an email just saying, uh, I evaluated this. It's really interesting. Uh, these are my opinions, but they're just, a, it's ultimately a business decision. He goes, oh, of course. Went back. By the time I landed, deal was done. Seven contracts with, with Disney. <laughs> uh, which, which is hard, which is hard. Uh, uh, another, you know, sort of a bad example, I think earlier on in my career when I was at AOL, you know, winning the battle and losing the war, a lot of people will really tend to overfocus on, you know, tough tactics, negotiation, and like getting these certain terms and this and that. The truth is I, I've always tried to simplify everything. If you're trying to do contracts with multiple parties, just try to use one. Uh, you know, just be tough. Say, no, we can't, we can't alter it. It's just one. It's just too complicated to manage lots and lots of contracts. And the reason for that is because you know, ultimately, you lose sight of execution. You lose sight of the product. You lose sight of the partnership. And I've had, I've had examples where it was like a six-month negotiation. We finally got it done, and then got it signed, and nothing happened, right? The, the, the ties had turned. The, the project lost priority. It just took too long, right? So great, we had a contract, but there's no product. So focus on execution. You know, keep things simple. And ultimately, once you do reel someone in, and you're having conversations with them, and you're negotiating, you know, maybe, maybe this is from my match days, but you know, date your partners. Not literally, figuratively. Uh, once you're in the door, it, it's like dating. It's easy to mess up a good thing. Uh, they're the client, right? Play it cool. If they ignore you for a while, it's not about you. It's probably them, right? It really is them, right? <laughs> they don't hate you. They're just busy, or they're doing something else, or they have other priorities. Uh, play it cool. When you're, uh, there's, there's no better way to spoil a deal uh, than to be uh, uh, too heavy. So that brings us to uh, Clover, uh, where I am now. Clover is a point of sale, is a platform. Uh, we used all these, uh, these essentially these techniques, uh, and we courted uh, three completely different businesses in our, the course of our, our pivots. The the first was uh, the media industry. The last was a uh, uh, banking and credit card processing. Completely different, use these techniques, it worked equally the same. And I, I, you know, having relatively new to biz dev, six and a half years, was a little nervous, go, oh, bankers must be so different than the media people in New York City versus publishers versus this. And I found out, no, they're not. They're the same. Everybody behaves the same. Uh, some people have slightly different fears, but it's all based on the content, not based on the underlying humanity of, of deal making. Uh, and we were very effective. Uh, we were able to get, I uh, just recently closed a deal. Uh, with the world's largest credit card processor. Uh, they do 1.5 trillion in transactions. Uh, the first data, they're a white label platform. So if you uh, get credit card processing from uh, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, or SunTrust, or PNC, or 200 other banks, uh, that's first data. And so we have a, a, a comprehensive agreement for them to distribute our product. And that was really to solve another problem. Um, one of our core features, we're building a point of sale platform one of the core things that we wanted to do is open an app store. But if you don't have distribution, an app store for merchants isn't in interesting. So we solved for that. We're launching our app store on September 7th. And uh, that's where we are today. Uh, I guess some closing thoughts. Uh, to, to actually close that, uh, have passion about what you do, even if you're not sure of the direction. People have always said to me, oh, you have so much enthusiasm about your product. I'm like, oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I, <laughs> I'm actually not that excited about it, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'll always be selling. The unexpected lead is really valuable. So the reason we got to our third, this third pivot at Clover that was so wildly successful and explosive, because I was pitching the wrong product at South by Southwest to the wrong people, and, but they were so interested in the team and in the technology, they started harassing us all the night. Said, dude, you gotta build a, a cash register, a point of sale platform, someone's gotta do it. And so we, we went in that direction. At first we didn't listen, but always be selling. Uh, and, and you know, ultimately, uh, and I think my last thoughts are, be very careful. Always offer, share, and educate. People really are receptive to that. Uh, never sell. People hate being sold to. And I have probably one minute, or is that it? Huh?
You have a question? Okay. Um, my question is regarding the in mail. Can you give us like the perfect in mail? Like, what is the subject line? How much? How mm. long is the length? Yeah, um, as short as possible. Uh, what, we, what you can do is you can actually like break it up into like three different paragraphs or two sentences each. That's fine. Uh, what I typically try to do in a subject line is something like, uh, we were funded by you know Andreessen Horowitz and Sutter Hill, so it's like Mark from Clover and Andreessen Horowitz Sutter Hill Company wanted to share more. You know, and then usually it's like, hey, we're working on this and that. You might be interested in it for these reasons. Um, I'd love to share more and get your expertise. You seem to be an expert in this space. You know, to kind of position in this feedback, and then once you actually get someone on the phone, then you can actually you can actually sort of start to build that bond and form that relationship. Right. Is the goal to get them on the phone? Um, yeah, typically, typically, because I, I don't email is not multi-dimensional enough to really uh, educate anything. I think there's too many assumptions, right? So, and, 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 and since it is still a human thing, I do think that they want to feel like you're a smart person that they should know, not just for now, but for later. And I've had many, 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 comp well, many, both Quantcast and Clover were after these pitches, uh, three weeks in, they're like, oh, uh, can I get a job there? <laughs> <laughs> And that's a fairly common occurrence with these startups. So, I'm like, actually, you're the EVP, and you probably make four hundred fifty thousand a year. So I don't think that's a good idea. But anyway, we'll keep you in mind. Thank you.